Well, thank you for joining me, and I'm very excited to introduce my good friend, Mark McClain. Mark is the CEO of CellPoint, which he co-founded in 2005 and took public in 2017. We, met, Mark, I guess we met during the Waveset days, but really got to know each other and work together uh, during CellPoint, which I can't believe that's now been 16 years. You and um, me both on that one. <laughs> Mark has 35 years experience in tech, 20 years as a leader in identity management. Mark was able to grow CellPoint successfully by focusing on what he believes matters most how your organization treats its people and creates useful products. Mark directs the overall vision and strategy at CellPoint. He's guided by his values. He ensures that the organization is filled with high performing teams that are constantly collaborating and in innovation and in innovating in service of the customer experience. Mark spent his early career in sales and marketing at IBM and Hewlett Packard. He co-founded Waveset, eventually selling to Sun Microsystems in 2003. From there, Mark and his team have formed CellPoint, the market's dominant player in identity governance services. Mark goes true to a few core priorities for him and his team, innovation, integrity, impact, and individuals. Mark, thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Eugene. It's a real pleasure, and I'm excited about our conversation. Hope it's going to be helpful to the folks on the line whenever they're listening. <laughs> well, and, and I want to call people's attention to Mark's book. Uh, which was released by Forbes Books just last year. And we were just discussing this. I've known Mark for a long time. We've had a, a lot of conversations about culture. I consider Mark one of my culture mentors. And Mark, this was six, seven years ago when we were you know, at lunch, I think, at Shay Z talking about the creation of Culturati. And thank you for your mentorship and guidance there. Um, what compelled you to write this book? It's not like you are already crazy busy. And I love the comments about you're talking to your board chair, Bill Bach, who, of course, is also my board chair. So what, why, why write the book? Yeah, it's a great question. I, honestly, I was a little skeptical. I could figure out how to get that done while still kind of actively running a company. And um, it turned out that the team had kind of a way of working with writers to help you kind of capture your thoughts and um and I, when, when we said, look, you know, you want to think about a book and Eugene, and I said, look, if that means I have to have one really big idea and three supporting ideas and four sub supporting ideas, there's my 12 chapter book. I'm screwed. I don't have that big idea. So I can talk about how to think about leadership and products and people and, and, and effectively for, for, for the, uh, the younger set, certainly, if not the older set, this sort of is a collection of blogs. This book is sort of a set of topics that I find helpful and interesting. And, and, and I think it's kind of particularly applicable to folks in the the early stages of a business, but it's pretty applicable to anybody leading a team, I hope. And I figured before I, uh, you know, croak one of these days, I better get some of this stuff written down. <laughs> so there you go. Well, and I'll, I'll, I'll call people's attention. It really is a manual and a, how, a how-to, and there's chapters on specific topics that are, you know, they're, they're practical and um, just practical advice. But Speaking about practical advice, Mark, we're we're we've been in unprecedented times over this last year. Mm -hmm. um, we hope that we're finally emerging from one of the most challenges experienced many of us have lived through. Uh, we've all been working remotely. You and I have talked about this, but how has it reinforced or altered your views about the importance of culture? I think it's absolutely reinforced them, Eugene. You know, there's an older phrase I think a lot of us have heard over the years about our personal uh, journey, which is something like crisis doesn't build character, it reveals character. I think what we've seen in this uh, pandemic environment is crisis doesn't so much build culture as reveal culture, right? Like if you had kind of a unhealthy culture before you went into the pandemic, it probably didn't get better. Uh, and if you had a healthy culture, it proved itself very strong, I think, as people rallied and, and stepped up. And we're very fortunate. We, that's how we look at the last year. We feel like our team had a set of values, had a way of thinking, had a way of treating each other, treating our customers and partners. And boy, they didn't miss a beat. You know, they just stepped into this, this kind of crazy working from anywhere, working from home, you know, environment. And, and it's really proven to be, undergird a lot of what's been actually a pretty strong performance here for us, which honestly, Eugene, stepping into this, it's just about a year ago, right? March of, of 20 is when it hit really hard. 
if you had asked me going into this how things would go, I was a little nervous. <laughs> um, I wasn't quite sure how things were going to play out. I, I'd love it when a millennial uh, type young young person in the company say, well, what do you think we should be doing? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> We've never seen anything like this, right? We're figuring this out as we go. So I think in some ways we relied on values and culture as we navigated a whole bunch of, uh, to use the famous word, unprecedented situations. And I think it's just proven that that when you've built a strong, healthy culture, and we'll probably go into what do we mean by culture, um, I think it's really proven to be quite a quite a strong advantage during this time. So, so even with a stronger culture, Cell Point had and has. What were some of the pain points that you had to address? Well, off, 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 no, off, obviously, there's the word I'm looking for, obviously. <laughs> uh, obviously, um, part of what happened was people's personal life, as we've all, all kind of done remote work at some level over the years, well, in this environment, your personal life kind of came crashing into your professional life. Probably the most true for young parents, right? We have a lot of of young professional parents in our team. And I used to joke that, you know, remember back, what is it, Eugene, three, four years ago, that famous CNN thing where the poor guy doing the interview, his kids come, <laughs> I think it's in Hong Kong or something, right? And the, the nanny is trying to grab the kids. And we're all laughing. Oh my gosh, how embarrassing, you know, <laughs> now that's every day, right? Uh-huh. Like people, I joke about the, you know, it's okay if the naked seven-year-old goes running behind you, please don't have your naked 17-year-old come running behind you. That could be awkward for your teammates. <laughs> but, uh, but at the end of the day, it's just like, if there ever was much of a boundary left on personal and professional, Zoom's kind of erased that, right? We're, we're looking inside each other's homes, having conversations while we're juggling parenting or caring for family members or whatever. So I think I think it sort of drove a stake in, in whatever boundary fully existed between work and personal. Not that, you know, we're not meant to overly intrude into each other's personal lives, but at some level, this just reminds all of us we're, we're not a different person at work than we are at home. We're just one person all day, every day, tr- and trying to get our work done as best we can, support our colleagues while we're juggling whatever constitutes our personal life. And, and I think it's just been a in some ways, a great reminder that, yeah, we got to do this to support our teammates, our colleagues. There's somebody who's kind of maybe got a tougher situation than somebody else. So let's support them through that. And then then they'll turn around and support their teammates through the next tough situation. You devote a lot of time in the book and I know in your own practices to the concept of work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I mean, think part of the the tenet of, of Culturati this year is mental health and well-being and we're finding <clears throat> excuse me the the lines between work and home um, so so blurred that that um, I find with with my staff and volunteers in different initiatives I have to make them turn turn off sometimes and since I'm such an insomniac and I catch up or catch up on emails over the weekend I've had to remind people please don't feel compelled to respond to me over the weekend. I'll, I'll text you if there's an emergency, but right. what, what are you finding? Um, what are you finding on the work-life balance? For- I, I tell you, Eugene, uh, I had written a chapter on that in the book, a couple chapters actually, and I'll, um, uh-huh. I'll give you the kind of the big takeaway that came out of some conversations with a buddy of mine who's a pastor, and we were talking about you know, sometimes people have a, a picture of their life that's a that's a pie chart, right? A, a series of wedges, aspects of your life, your family, your health, your friends, your fitness, your you know spiritual life, whatever is kind of your know, hobbies, a- activities, all these things that are kind of components of our life. And I think there's this sort of mythical balance, like someday I'm going to get it just right. Every, you know, right. health will be 17% of my pie, family 22 and a half percent, you know, work 17.9, you know, it's, it's like as if someday you're going to find the perfect balance and hold it. And so we came up with this completely non-marketing friendly term that life is a series of temporary, healthy, imbalances right like you're constantly kind of rejiggering balance at all times over certainly over months if not weeks and days and and what you need is an acknowledgement that whatever imbalance you're in right now probably is temporary work might be intense you might have a sick kid at home you might have gotten out of shape and it's new year's and you're trying to uh, you know put more energy into your health but while you're in some sort of imbalance, the trick is to try to remain healthy in that imbalance, right? Because when we get completely out of balance and stay there for a long time, and let's go back to work, that's one of the most common ways that happens, right? People get to a norm 
I just saw something in the press yesterday, the day before, Eugene, a bunch of uh, first year analysts at Goldman Sachs are suing Goldman Sachs because they're they're being treated in their minds abusively, 100 plus hours a week uh, of work. Well, that's way out of balance. And you might be able to do that for a little while. You can't sustain that for any significant period without massive damage to the rest of your life, your personal life, your health, something, right? I so noticed you, did, you didn't cite, you, you cited a firm known for kind of churning through its people, but you right. didn't name them in the book. <laughs> yes, no, and, and, and to be fair, a lot of firms have challenges with kind of working their new people really hard and saying that's it's almost like the military boot camp mindset. I'm going to kick your butt <laughs> for a while. And look, there is some level of when you're starting out, people expect you to kind of put in some time and learn the business, learn your job. I, I did it when I was young. But I was year, right. Yeah. You can't do 100 hours a week for any sustained period of time and have a life. Right. And so back to your point, what's happened in the pandemic? Right. The good news is it has reinforced the incredible flexibility. I love what you said. I've had that same issue of, oh, should I send a note on Saturday morning? Because I really don't expect somebody to answer me till Monday. And if they see it, are they going to feel compelled to answer me? So I'm like, you know, I've given people, hey, just because I send you a note or especially an email, don't expect a response right away. Like, like you, text still is sort of the more urgent kind of mechanism. Slack somewhere in the middle of these days. Some people use Slack like email. Some people use it more like a text, urgent. I, I haven't quite figured out where Slack fits. But um, but all that to say, I think it's that sense of kind of that's where it comes down to respect, letting people manage their life and say, you get to your work, what fits your personal schedule. But if it's really urgent, I'll let you know. And I might ping you a second time. Hey, I need you to look at that within the next hour or two because it is urgent. And then people respond to that, right? But it's that sense of of letting people as professionals make their own choice. Um, and one thing I'll say here, Eugene, I think that's we've discovered, but you said you had people starting to push themselves too hard. I think we've all seen a lot of that, right? Like, um, have you heard this? I love this or love it, love it, hate it, but it's true. People said, you know, working from home has sort of turned into living at work, <laughs> right? Like I'm at work all day, every day. Wait a minute, that's not good, right? And so we we did, did something. I don't think it was original with us, but I've seen other companies do it. We we decreed a couple hours each uh, Tuesday, Thursday as free to focus time, meaning kind of banished from meetings and, and stuff. So people knew a couple hours a week, they can count on the fact that if they need to catch the kid up on the homework, take a trip somewhere to the store, just something because, or just take a break, put on the headphones and or take a walk, right? This idea that people were just backing back to back stuff. And, and all of a sudden people went, wow, I'm, I'm sitting at this chair, staring at this screen all day. I got to quit doing that. And so we sort of said, here, we'll help. We'll give you kind of an enforced break <laughs> a couple of times a week. So you just kind of turn it Mark, off. Say again, what you call, say again, what you oh, call that. that that's credit what, to my good friend, Abby, uh, free to focus. You know, you're free to focus during this time. Like focus. You want to focus on your work, focus on your family, focus on your health, you know, just whatever you need to do. Uh, Mark, let's back up a little bit. Would you give us your definition of culture? What is culture and what isn't culture in your mind? Yeah, and we even use this phrase pseudo culture in the book, Eugene, which I don't, I don't expect that term to stick. But, but I think sometimes people fell into the trap, I'll say, of thinking culture was the accoutrements or the appearance of culture. Things like in Austin, we'd say breakfast tacos and beer in the fridge. Out in the valley, it might be a on-site chef every day, which you know is amazing to me. But I, the idea of you know food and amenities and perks and that stuff is nice. I'm not saying it's not nice. We do some of those things. But that's not culture. To me, culture is kind of how you get work done and how you treat each other. That's culture. And so part of how you get work done and how you treat each other might be we give you some fun perks and have team outings and serve in the community, a bunch of stuff that isn't, quote, work the way we normally define work. But most of what matters in culture is exactly how you do work, right? How you, how you set expectations, how you manage performance, how you deliver on commitments to customers and partners and colleagues. That's culture. And so to me, culture starts with values. Uh, I had this uh, chapter that definitely was a little bit controversial for some people in the book. Because, you know, there's this idea of, you know, define your mission and then your vision of where you want to go and then your values. And I said, look, I actually think you start with values because no offense, mission and vision can change. I think we love to, to act like people had these brilliant insights and forever that was their mission. I mean, so many great companies are so doing different things than they started. 
right? No offense. I don't think Jeff Bezos thought about Amazon Web Services when he was starting Amazon. And it's the single most profitable part of Amazon, right? It, he was selling books and he probably thought he was going to sell more stuff. But did he imagine being the single largest provider of web infrastructure for corporations? I don't think so. I think that's giving him too much credit. He's a brilliant guy, but his his mission of what the company was all about changed. I don't think his values did. And I think we started with, look, there's a set of core values. You mentioned our, our four I words. We, we like to say it's easy to remember the, theoretically because it's four I words. You know, we talk about innovation and how we, how we build creative products for real problems. We talk about integrity, following through on our commitments. We talk about impact, measuring, rewarding results, not activity. And, and then kind of undergirding all that, we talk about individuals, which is just valuing people, all of our people. And I think those values, back to even navigating the pandemic, that's what held us together and focused. Yeah, we have a vision for our company and the products we're building and serving our customers. But I think those core values are what kind of unites us. It, it provides what I sometimes call the connective tissue that makes us feel like an organism, um, not just an organization. And how do we treat actively each other. And I think that's what culture is really all about. You know, I'm, I'm, I was reminded, I had, I, had, um, I had skimmed the book when, when it came out and over the last week I've read all the book and I'm reminded about a couple of things, Mark. One is how, whether, whether you say it or not, it comes across that, that um, culture and leadership are so inter, intertwined that they, they can't be separated. And, and if they're good, you don't want them separated. And right. secondly, I was blown away, and I'd never known um, about the concept of the chaplain. Mm. So, you know, um, religious persuasions or, or thoughts aside, um, can you tell us a little bit about leadership and, and if any examples that you have from this time that we found ourselves in the last 12 months and then what the chaplaincy has looked like and what it means. Yeah, no, it's funny. It's a, it's a concept that's very well understood in probably two domains, right? The military and maybe other public environments, right? There's been a chaplain of the Senate and the chaplain of the Congress forever in our country. And everybody's familiar with chaplains in the military. It, it does have a religious overtone to it that kind of makes people a little uncomfortable but it's, it's the concept of a caregiver, right? What chaplains are doing is being caregivers. They're checking that. I always think of it as uh, putting their arm around someone, coming alongside them and saying, hey, are you, how are you doing, right? And, and that sometimes comes from just reading people in real life, which has been difficult <laughs> during the pandemic. We're not bouncing off of each other and seeing quite as good a facial, you know, pickup or body language as it were. But sometimes it's just knowing enough, being close enough to people that there's something major going on. You know, as we've gotten large, Eugene, um, what Cam McMartin, who you know well, our, CEO, our now now board member, former CFO, once said to me, look, Mark, we got over a thousand people here. There's something major going on in somebody's life every day. You know, right. they're dealing with their their own cancer or cancer in their family. They're they're wrestling with a marital challenge. I like to say they're wrestling with the tension of teenagers. Oh wait, that's just the definition of having teenagers is <laughs> having tension. Um, but but this idea that there's these things going on. And so yeah, kind of the chaplains and let's tie it back into overall leadership. We expect our managers, directors, our chain of command as it were, to also to have that same kind of caring mindset, right? You're you're both there to get work done through people but you're also there to care for those people because if they aren't in good shape, whatever that means, good mental health, physical health, whatever, they're not gonna be able to get their work done, are they? So if you ignore that and just keep you know, whipping, whipping them saying work, 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 uh, you know, they will exit stage left when they get the opportunity. So I think at the end of the day, this leadership idea is really about how do you manage professionals? How do you manage people? And, and it certainly starts with caring for them. And chaplains are just another great embodiment of that in our culture. But it also is, is about how you think about people. Uh, I, I think I stole this from some of Eugene along the way, but this is one I can't remember, so I can't give credit. <laughs> but somewhere along the way, I kind of got this concept of guardrails in my mind about managing professionals. And, and here's how I think of it. Because again, this may or may not apply to kids making fries. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've never managed that kind of work environment, just completely, you know, remote, uh, remote um, rope repetition. But in professionals, right, I always say, look, you got to keep between these guardrails. You've got to keep people between micromanagement. Never micromanage a competent professional. They will vote with their feet and exit, right? They just won't 
put up with it for very long. If you're telling them what to do all day, every day, they'll say, why are you, why, why do you need me? Hire, you know, hire a trained robot, right? Just let them think, let them use their experience, their, their capabilities, their training. But the other guardrail, and sometimes early stage tech companies fall into this, is you don't give them enough clarity or enough direction so they know sort of what success looks like. So the guardrails are give people enough direction, clarity of where you need them to go, kind of the objectives, the goals you're trying to get to, but enough freedom so that they can accomplish that in their own ways, using their own skills and knowledge and training. That's where people live in a place of job empowerment, job satisfaction. If they have interesting problems to work on, great teammates to work with, and they have enough freedom to kind of bring their skill and intelligence to that. I think that's what makes people feel great every day. And if they're cared for, right, as we started, if they're cared for and people know, you know, there's the old people don't um, care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? If they see the evidence that the leadership cares about them as people, they're going to bust their butt and do really great work. I really believe that. Another great line that I hadn't heard before. People don't care, care how much you know until know they know how much they, they care. Know you care. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Mark, but tell us, so the practicality, and, and you had chaplains even before the pandemic. Oh, yeah, um, right. This, this especially, this especially um, resonates. So I've been talking to some other companies, one with 130,000 employees, and, and we've been talking about empowering frontline managers that, that we have, um, because of the pandemic, all of a sudden, these frontline managers who are normally backed up by, you know, huge corporate infrastructure that gets to observe people at the water cooler and in the workplace and, and is part of the conversation. Right now, we're, we're relying on these frontline managers, some who are not, not especially seasoned as, as managers, um, to report back what we're hearing or what we need to address. So I love the concept that you've got outside individuals checking in with employees is is this continuing during the pandemic and if so how does it work yeah it's been tricky we've had a, a transition in the firm we were using for chaplains we're kind of revisiting that in the meantime i've had some of our employees who have kind of seasoned senior presence and have kind of that that spiritual depth and emotional depth to understand that hey I, I'm picking up on something that maybe you're not in a great place today. And as you said, Eugene, the hardest thing has been figuring out how to do that in the context of being remote. I, I think all, all of us would acknowledge, you know, you, you sometimes pick up on a teammate being a little out of kilter, just watching them, just watching how their head is down or if they're kind of dragging when they're normally a little more pep in their step or whatever it is it's harder it's much harder to pick up on that and i think some of it comes from intentionality right just we've all talked about that i felt like i had to take all my 30 minute meetings and make them 45 because the first 15 is how are you doing how's things at home how are your kids right you sort of had to add add this cushioning into meeting time because the health, healthy human thing to do is to check on people before you jump right to the topic. Now, with people you talk to all day, every day, you don't have to ask maybe every time, but you know, I think it's, it's a little bit of a, again, start with the caring thing. Um, in the chaplain's case, it has been challenging to do that remote. We have talked about how do we effectively do that without the walking around thing. Uh, you know, talked about one of the, one of the places I was early in my career was HP, Hewlett Packard. And you know, some things weren't great there, frankly, but some things were pretty good. One of their one of their brilliant uh, thoughts, I think, goes way back to the founders was management by walking around. Right. A manager can't just sit at their desk and know what's happening in their team. They've got to get up and move around. H how does that look in remote? It, it means everything from kind of popping in on Zoom meetings to kind of checking in on people unexpectedly, not just on the one on ones that are scheduled. Just that idea of kind of being present and visible. Um, you know, I've tried to up my communication quite a bit during the pandemic, more video recorded messages to my team, more interaction with um, sub sub management team members who I don't necessarily engage with as often just so they feel like, hey, we're here for you. You know, we're here to help. How, how can we help you get through this? Um, but a lot of it really does have to be delegation to those leaders to say, you've got to be checking on your folks a lot and really making sure they're not just getting their work done, but they're navigating this difficult time. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's been a heck of a 12 months, man. It's been a heck of a 12 months. Well, I think, I think you've, you've almost exhaustively answered my next question, which is, you know, what was the, 
reaction to the shift in, from work from anywhere? And um, did it bump up against or reinforce any of the com components of culture? Um, any, any well, thoughts yeah, on I mean, I, th there's undoubtedly, it's made aspects of it hard, but in, in this, uh, you know, I've used the phrase silver lining a lot, the old, you know, dark cloud mm -hmm. silver lining. There's a lot of silver linings in this thing if you're looking for them, right? I mean, it has... It has the, the, we joked about the, the kids running behind the Zoom screen. It's it's almost forced people to go, oh, is that your kid? Is that your wife? You know, you, you've there, there's always been this funny line. We got trained very carefully in interviewing not to you know probe about people's personal life. So we weren't biased in some way. I think we've oversteered on that deal to where I'm just completely objective, you know, about you as another worker. Right now, these are people you work with them all day, every day. Uh, Pat Lencioni, who's one of the authors I like about culture. I know you know his work, too. Um, um, he once said, uh, you know, why do we feel the need to put the at modifier work in front of friends when it comes to those friends? Like, these are my work friends. No, they're just your friends. <laughs> you know, you happen to work with them, but they're your friends. So it's natural to know about their lives, see how they're doing, find out about what's going on in the lives of their family members or kids without, again, inserting or probing more than is appropriate. But but just sort of like, hey, I, I you mentioned your kid was going to be graduating. How'd that go through the pandemic? There was a lot of those conversations, you know, kids who are going through a, a transition in school and how did they navigate it? So I think it did, it did make it more difficult to get those um, ad hoc interactions that I think were part of the fabric of the culture, but it, the silver lining was when you did engage with people and still we still are engaging with people primarily on zoom you are getting that window into their life that was harder in some ways at work you know you're seeing their back backdrop whatever it is or they, they the kiddos running by or the cats and the boy we know each other's pets a lot more than we used to um that's a funny one right so uh uh, you know, I, I feel like I, I don't have a pet at home. I feel like I should have a stuffed animal near me just to, to fit in. But uh, but it, in some ways, it's just fun to kind of get to learn those things about what people's personal lives are about. Well, again, I, I think there's a there's an inappropriate line. We, we still have to tell people don't don't step over to make someone uncomfortable. But just showing you care, showing your concern about them is totally appropriate. You know, it, it, it that um, your the nuances for you. Uh, Gosh, and I have just, I have just made, you know, I continue to fail at sometimes promoting someone really who's doing such a great job because they're doing such a great job and then put them into management, asking them to, to um, supervise some other people. And, and I like, I loved the question that you set, which is, is this someone who likes getting things done through other people? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, the the nuance on that leadership piece is, of course, if you get things done for other people, you, to do it effectively, you have to care about other people and you have to know about other people. Totally. So, yeah, no, that's that's um, a thing. Um, yeah, that's a thing uh, we talk about a lot, Eugene. I, I feel like over the course of my career, I've heard so little about that. And, and it's something uh, we talk about a lot. And, and the point you're on that we kind of talk about in the book a little is this idea that just because someone has done well in their job, it's not clear that the right move for them next is to manage people in that function. Um, we see it as the most normal growth pattern in a lot of corporate settings, right? Well, you're a great salesman. You should be a sales manager. You're a great engineer. You should be an engineering manager. You're a great accountant. You should be an accounting manager maybe, <laughs> right, I think is, is the question we ought to insert there, because quite often people are taking that step either because they think it's expected, or frankly, quite often because they know it can come with more compensation. And so there's this concept that we certainly have had in tech for a long time now of the, of the technical ladder. I think it was originally applied primarily to engineering, software development, or other kinds of engineering, but it really applies everywhere, which is you've got to have a growth path, both kind of recognition, and compensation that is not related to leading people because otherwise people feel compelled to jump into leading people as a way to promote their career or gain advancement in, in compensation. And they're not good at it, nor do they probably wanna do it. Um, and so I think there is this idea that you want to find people who, who've got a demonstrated interest and capacity for leading through others. Um, 
the metaphor, again, I totally borrowed, didn't come up with that I use in the book is that of an, a conductor, right? Like a person who undoubtedly used to play an instrument or sing or do something, but now all they do is wave a little stick, <laughs> right? Their job is to get music from all of the musicians in the choir, the orchestra, the band, whatever, but but they're not actually producing music. And that's the job of a manager, right? Your job is to get work done through others. But again, how you do that really matters. I like to say, if you're, if you're, if you're a violinist and in the first chair violinist flubs up a passage and you grab their violin and go, let me show you how to do that and play it. Like that, that person probably doesn't want to stay in your orchestra, right? But we see managers do that all the time, right? You, you flub that up here. Let me show you how to do that. Grab the wheel, get out of the way. <laughs> like, yeah, you're not going to build a lot of great loyalty and, and camaraderie with that teammate, right? So as a conductor, you have to learn, I'm going to get comfortable that sometimes it won't be the quality of music I might've once played if I'm a really good musician, but I'm gonna get way more music out of a out of an orchestra of a hundred than I ever could have produced by myself, right? And um, I was, the other answer here sometimes Eugene is parenting is a great tool here, <laughs> right? Cause like uh, somewhere along the way you had to let your kids start to do things knowing they will not do as well as you, but at some point they got to start doing things. So they learn whether that's making the bed, mowing the yard, helping with the dishes, helping with the meal, something, right. They're going to have to learn and, and you're going to have to let them do something at an inferior quality than you, but that's how they learn and grow. Same, same principle applies at work. Right. So, yeah, I think that idea of not forcing people into a management track just because they're good is, is a very, very missed thing in corporate America. I think we see people get bumped into leadership all the time, leadership as in management, and they just shouldn't be. They, they should keep playing the instrument to keep the metaphor going. Not that I'm always, not that I've always been successful in, in accomplishing this, but my father um, used to say, mijo, mijo is a Spanish term of endearment for son. Um, just make the people below you and the people above you look good and don't worry about yourself. You'll do well. So I, it, I have, I've tried to follow that. And uh, Mark, you know, I want to make sure people understand that Glassdoor named you one of the top CEOs in America. And I was just um, looking at uh, reading an article that talked that, that the MIT Sloan and Glassdoor together conducted a study. And they've determined that the most important driver uh, of um, cu culture during the pandemic has been transparency and, and a level of communication from executives. What do you think of that? Uh, completely. I completely, by the way, I would claim it was true before the pandemic, but pandemic just highlighted it, right? I think, I think as a leader, well, we joked about, you know, the, the the young folks coming up to me when the thing was first unfolding a year ago and say, hey, you know, how do we get through this? <laughs> I don't know. That's transparency. Uh, we're going to figure this out as we go because we have to. We haven't seen anything quite like this. So that transparency, it goes back to what you were just saying, Eugene, about, you know, you, you didn't use the word, but it was humility, right? You said, you know, take care of the people above you and below you. There's a great, well, long as we're passing along great quotes, uh, this one I think belongs to C.S. Lewis, a great uh, author, Christian author, and, and secular books as well. He said, um, humility isn't thinking less of yourself than you should, like downplaying yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less, <laughs> right? That's what your dad's advice was. Just don't think about yourself all the time. Think about the others around you and how you make them look good, how you make them successful. And I think that's we, we talk about uh, the phrase, no smart jerks at work, right? We don't want people that are super awesome, but they're real pains in the butt to deal with. So that idea that a humble person is not someone who self-deprecates in an unreal fashion. I have to say, it's not Steph Curry or LeBron James going, I'm a pretty average basketball player. We all go, that's ridiculous. You're amazing, right? So it's not, it's not the false humility of self-deprecation that's not real. It's saying, look, I am a good player. I am a good software engineer, financial person, salesperson. It's just not about me. It's about the team. It's how we win together. Those people are the greatest teammates on the planet because they're really good at what they do, but they're not about self-promotion all the time. And that's that's how you build a great team. Mark, thank you so much. You continue to remind us humility, transparency, and genuine concern for others. Uh, you've been a great mentor around culture. You've been a consistent supporter of the Culturati Summit. I know you've attended all but one and that was you were traveling overseas. Uh, you continue to sponsor and Cellpoint um, is a great partner. Thank you for being with us today.
Thanks, Eugene. It was a real pleasure. I enjoyed the chat. I, I Again, I, I wish all these folks out there that are trying to figure out how to make their cultures healthy and build great businesses much success. It's not easy, but it's worth it. Cool.